That Sober Guy podcast contains adult content, merciless truth, and emotional nudity. Listener discretion is advised. up thank you for tuning in today thanks to humans for bringing us in thanks to you for supporting the show i'm shane raymer you're listening to that sober guy podcast and we help people stay sober Uh, always good to be back on the microphone this week and we got an awesome episode today for you i can't wait to dive into this Uh, today's guest is william shaberg and uh, uh william's a scholar a rare book dealer writer and historian Uh, and he recently published writing the big book the creation of aa which illuminates the history of one of the most important spiritual movements of the 20th century and gives readers an unprecedented look inside the creation of Alcoholics Anonymous, the basic text of the recovery movement, uh, and it's sold more than 37 million copies of the big book worldwide. Uh, a recent, uh, I'm sorry, a result of 11 years of in-depth research drawing on primary real-time documents, Uh, William helps reveal the iconic stories of the founders of AA, their motivations, uh, and the obstacles they face trying to bring their message of hope to a wider audience. Uh, Also joining me today is my good friend and sponsor, Buddy C. Uh, Pumped to have both these guys here today. Looking forward to a great conversation and education about the history of AA. And we're going to get to all of this in just a minute. But before we do that, be sure to check us out at thatsoberguy.com. And you can connect with us on Instagram at realthatsoberguy. Uh, and on Twitter, at Shane Raymer. Now, let me tell you real quick about a couple of our sponsors and uh, big love and thanks to to both of them. And first, uh, we're going to talk about Foundations Recovery Network. Finding the right treatment for addiction and mental health illness can be tough. There's a lot of options out there. Who do you trust? Uh, that's why we've continued to partner with Foundations Recovery Network. They stay true to their mission and have high ethical standards. Uh, they also have treatment facilities, both inpatient and outpatient uh, throughout the country. So if you want more information, you have some questions for uh, for some help for you or a loved one, uh, you can go to foundationshelp.com slash sober guy, uh, or you can call 833-81-SOBER. That's 833-81-SOBER. You can talk with an admissions coordinator about treatment options. They can answer any questions for you. Uh, and then also let's talk about Clean Cause real quick. Uh, really excited to partner with these guys a couple months back. They got a great story. They're out of uh, out of Austin, Texas, I believe. Uh, and you might say, what is Clean Cause? Well, Clean Cause is an organic sparkling Herba Mate energy drink. I'm actually drinking one right now, the Lemon Lime. Uh, it's got minerals, amino acids, naturally occurring caffeine. There's four flavors. You have peach, raspberry, lemon lime, and blackberry. Uh, and uh, not only do they taste great, you get some good energy out of them. They're organic, fair trade. Here's the best part. 50% of all clean cause drink profits support recovery from alcohol and drug addiction. Uh, to date, clean cause has granted uh, over $420,000 in sober living scholarships. Uh, and here's how you can be a part of it. You get a great drink. You can order uh, a monthly subscription if you'd like. You can also buy them out at the store. They sell them here at the Nugget in Vacaville. I found them there and some other spots. But if you want to get the monthly subscription, you can get 20% off your first order by going to www.cleancause.com and uh, enter the promo code SOBERGUY. And uh, you can get that 20% discount, get yourself a great drink, and help support the recovery movement. So big thanks to foundations, big thanks to clean cause. And let's jump in to this conversation today. I've really been looking forward to this. There's a lot of content here. Um, William's done some extensive research on that. So let me welcome him first. Uh, William Shaberg to the show. How you doing, man? I'm doing great today. Thanks for, uh, for inviting me on the show. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to you. Yeah, absolutely, man. Uh, we, we're excited to talk to you today. And when I say we, let me introduce Buddy. Buddy C, how you doing, man? Thanks for coming on today. Doing good, my friend. Happy to be here. Thank you for including me. I was excited about this. 
And I want to thank William too, because uh, I've really enjoyed the time I've read his book and I've sat down for several hours and gone through different things. It's good to read a historical perspective on a lot of the things that changed our lives, Mm. you know? Yeah, absolutely, man. So where did this journey start for you, uh, William? What made you want to write the book? Where where did this all begin? Well, I got to tell you, Shane, I'm I'm a rare book dealer. That's what I do for a living. I've got a a business called Athena Rare Books here in Fairfield, Connecticut. And uh, actually, I wrote a book on the German philosopher Nietzsche in 95 because I couldn't figure out what was the first edition and what wasn't. And I Mm -hmm. And I ended up doing research and writing that book, and the University of Chicago Press published that book. So kind of the same thing happened here with this uh, AA problem. I, my, I, I, I specialize in first edition philosophy books and psychology, and that kind of gets me into the AA world. Uh, the AA book, Alcoholics Anonymous, was published in April of 1939. But um, in February before that, the February before that, they, they multilift printed, they offset printed, uh, a number of copies of the text as it was at that point and circulated it for comments. Mm. And I bought one of those multilith copies at an auction. So now I'm a rare book dealer guy. So the question is, well, how rare is this book? I mean, how many <laughs> copies of this thing did they run off in February of 1939? I knew they had spent $165 on the printing, but I just, I just couldn't find it. Some people said 100, some people said 200, 300. Bill Wilson, the founder of AA, always said 400. So I, I finally got permission to go down to the GSO archive, the General Service Office Archive of Alcoholics Anonymous in New York City, and I was looking for the invoice. I figured I could find the invoice for the printing, you know. Mm, and yeah. I, uh, I started digging. They had just tons of material down there. I started digging through the material. I never found the invoice there or anywhere else. But, but, I, but of course, since I couldn't find the invoice, I started looking for more information about how they came about actually printing this multilith copy, what went into that, and the more the more I backed into the story, the more I got sucked in. It was just like Alice going down the rabbit hole. And uh, when, I, when I came out the other side, uh, I have a 600 plus pages of text in this book, plus a, almost 200 pages of scholarly appendices and stuff in the back. And uh, and I I wasn't planning on doing that, but you know I'm one of those guys who kind of follow your nose and your enthusiasm, and that's that's what we did. Yeah, that's great. I love how uh, sometimes God takes us down paths that we don't even uh, we don't even know they're coming, man. And we're just open to them, and we find ourselves like yourself, six hundred pages deep, and in in this awesome book of history. Well, here here's the here's the magic question, I guess, or my magic question: Did you ever find out how many books there were in that first edition, and how much is the book that you have worth? <laughs> no, I never found out. Uh, how many copies had actually been printed. Hmm. Um, the copy the copy that I bought, though, is, isn't just one of those, let's say, 400 copies. Let's be generous. Say it's not just one of 400 copies. Um, and, of course, the question is then how many of those survived if there were 400 copies? I, people have speculated less than 50. But the copy I've got was a copy owned by Jim Burwell. Jim Burwell was an incredibly important guy in the formation of Alcoholics Anonymous and the writing of the book. Jim Burwell is commonly referred to as the New York Atheist. He was the guy who didn't want to have anything to do with that God bunk. And he was very <laughs> vocal about that stuff. Yeah. And uh, I've got I got Jimmy's copy of the uh, oh. of the multilith. And uh, you know he's he's made notes. He's got this wonderful list of here's here's the eleven people he says who stayed sober, uh, who were sober, you know, who stayed sober um, since the book was written. Uh, and then he's got a list of uh, I think there's I think there's thirty seven people below that who were helpful in getting the book written, but didn't stay continuously sober. Some of them got sober, got drunk and never came back. And some of them got drunk and did come back. So I've got Jimmy's handwritten notes in this book. So it's, it's a very, very, very special copy. Buddy, let me kick it to you, man. I know, I know you have some good questions here too, and I'm excited to hear what some of those are too. What, what, what are you thinking? Where should we kind of dive into this at? William, I see that in the front of the book, you have a dedication to uh, yeah. King Dykeman, uh, yeah. I, and and he was your mentor, I think is how you put it. So uh, I imagine he influenced you a lot to start looking in this direction, huh? King Dykeman was uh, my mentor and my best friend for over 40 years. Um, he was a local guy here who uh, 
He taught philosophy at Fairfield University, and as I think I told you, my rare book business specializes in first edition philosophy books. It's been one of my ongoing lifelong interests. So he and I actually had a guy I could talk philosophy to. And, uh, and, and King was sober. He got sober when he was 22, and he was continuously sober until he died at 81. He was over 60 years sober. And uh, so mm-hmm. I, I heard a lot of stories about early AA history and early AA um, uh, King had actually uh, been been to New York City when he was a year sober, and they took him to the Bill Wilson birthday breakfast, which was in December, you know, and they introduced him to Bill Wilson. I couldn't believe they had a 23-year-old guy sober, you know, that kind of thing wow. in those days. Yes. Uh, so so he was, he was in many ways my my entree into this, this particular world, but he was, uh, he died... Uh, he died August eighth, two thousand and seventeen. I miss him every single day. Mm. Sorry for your loss, sir. Thank you. I do. I do have a question for you, though. As you started doing the digging in this, what did you realize from those stories that you had been told? What jumped out to you in a positive way that you did not realize from all of this research? Is there anything particular? That, well, so much, that really jumped out to you that you didn't realize before uh, that wasn't part of the, you know, all of the, uh, uh, you know, the, the part of part of all the persona that's AA and Bill Wilson and all these things that uh, that really jumped out. Yeah, well, one of the things that jumped out was that uh, it. It didn't take me long to realize that Bill Wilson was a, just a dreadful, terrible historian. You know, I mean, the stories that he told just weren't, they just weren't historically accurate. And we, quite frankly, it took me a while to dig into this and realize how, how extensive he was modifying stories. But Bill Wilson was modifying stories for a point. He was, he was getting rid of the messy details so that the, so that the stories would have an impact. And he was changing some of the stories so that it would have the kind of impact he wants. This, this was a man, this was a man who had this unbelievable, he was a man of vision. He had this grand, universal, uplifting, deeply spiritual, life-saving vision. And he was trying to sell that to people who were drinking and destroying their lives. And he was trying to get them to turn their lives around. Bill Wilson was a preacher. So we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't fault preachers for telling parables or passing along myths. But Bill Wilson was a, wasn't preaching salvation in the next world. Bill Wilson was preaching, preaching salvation in this world, in the here and now. So the fact that he changed those, that he wasn't a historian, that he wasn't sticking to pure historical fact, uh, was something I had to, had to wrestle with a little bit in the beginning. But then once I, once I realized what this guy was doing, uh, I was fine with that. And, and one of the things that happens in the book is that uh, a lot of the stories that Wilson told turned out to be you know, close but no cigar. And sometimes they're just really, really bordering on made up. But I'm okay. I'm totally okay with that. Because if Wilson hadn't done that, he wouldn't have been as successful as he was. And Lord knows Bill Wilson was successful in in creating and launching Alcoholics Anonymous. I mean, it's 80 years since his book was published. Uh, AA says there's over 2 million people sober today. Uh, Who knows how many, nobody knows how many millions and millions and millions of people's lives have been saved by the work he did. So I certainly can't fault him for that. He did exactly what he what he needed to do, exactly what he should have done. But when I got into the stories, I found all kinds of things that were that were just either not mentioned in Bill's story, or they were completely different from the stuff that Bill the stories that Bill told. The biggest the biggest takeaway from this whole thing, the biggest, if you will, shock uh, to uh, to, to me was that there's this guy named Hank Parkers. Hank Parkers was a guy that Bill got sober in late 1935 in New York City. He and Bill were joined at the hip. In Bill's history uh, of AA called AA Comes of Age, which he wrote in 5, 1955, Hank makes a couple of appearances. He just kind of dry, you know, kind of drive by appearances in that text. But the fact of the matter is, Hank Parkers is the second most important man in the writing and creation of this book. And in my opinion, the writing and creation of this book is the creation of Alcoholics Anonymous. I mean, you, you don't have Alcoholics Anonymous until you got the 12 steps. And the 12 steps didn't appear until April 10th, 1939. That's the deal. So, so here's Parkers, this guy who's just pushing Bill all the time, pushing Bill all the time to write the book, to do the book, to give him more chapters on the book. 
to write it this way. Don't write it this way. They were fighting about the content all the time. And I, I'm, I'm fond of saying, no Hank, no book. Now, that's not to say that Alcoholics Anonymous wouldn't have ended up with a book at some point, but it would not have ended up with, would never have had a book in, in April of 1939. And the book we would have ended up with, what, five years later or three years later or ten years later, would have been radically different from what they produced in April of 1939. I, I get off on this thing about the people argue about, you know, co-founders. Bill Wilson was always, he was always, that was another thing he did. He was, he was always trying to take the spotlight off himself. So he was giving other people credit for stuff. So this, you know, Dr. Bob, the co-founder, and, and then, you know, William James is a co-founder, and Sam Shoemaker is a co-founder, and, oh, good Lord. Uh, Hank Parkers, if there's, a, if there's anybody who deserves the title of co-founder of Alcoholics Anonymous, it's Hank Parkers, a guy who most people in A have never heard of. Yeah, who? So Actually, who? Who was Hank com- to Bill? They were. They were. He was his best friend uh, throughout his early sobriety, mm. and they were. They were. Bill set him up uh, in business. He got people to finance him to set up a business that they called Honor Dealers. The business was over in New Jersey, in Newark, New Jersey. Bill was living in Brooklyn. Um, and, uh, and when Bill actually wrote the book, not necessarily the first two chapters, but all the rest of the chapters were actually written in Honor Dealer's office over in Newark, New Jersey. Hank Parkers was looking over his shoulder all the time, arguing with him. Parkers had been a very, very successful businessman, um, spent most of his career working for Standard Oil, mm-hmm. made himself a ton of money. Uh, you know, he was at one point, I think in his resume, he claimed he was in charge of 6,000 people and 6,000 people underneath him and uh but he got he got drunk and just 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 about killed himself and wilson finally met him at town's hospital and sobered him up uh, i believe in october of 1935 and they were just as i say they, they were they were just living in each other's back pocket from from that point forward and then can you explain to us what actually hank parkhurst was on my list of of questions for you um, and I enjoyed what you said about him and the research that you did. Now, why did they part ways? Can you, you want to explain uh, the whole uh, reason why he's yeah, not? Yeah. Yeah, the, yeah. The back half of the story is how come he's only gets drive by mentions in Bill book. If he, if he was so <laughs> right. critically important, how did he get left out of the story? There's an, there's an outstanding reason for that. I mean, one of the other things Wilson did was when he told his stories, he always left out a lot of uncomfortable facts. Um, and one one of the hugely, if not the most uh, uncomfortable fact uh, when he was telling stories in the late 40s and, and, and after that was that six months after the book was published, Hank Parkers was drunk and he mm-hmm. never got sober again. Mm-hmm. So how can you how can you tell the glorious story of the production of the book and put a spotlight on a guy named Hank Parkers? And then you have to admit, you know, all the stuff that ended up in that book, it didn't work for him. He got drunk, and he stayed drunk for the rest of his life. Wow. Hey, William, I wonder if that had any influence on the writing of the traditions, the anonymity, and all those things. thats I've never thought about that, but that probably had a lot of influence on that, too. Well, Who it knows? certainly could have, but now we're getting off into it. I haven't done any research on the traditions. I think, well, wait I think, on that. Maybe that'll be your next book, and you can come back and we can <laughs> talk about that. <laughs> uh you know, somebody, now, somebody, I, needs, somebody needs to do that book on the traditions. Yeah, and I've talked to a couple of friends about I'm trying to jack people up so they actually go down and do the research. Yeah. Your, your section in the book, Bill Wilson, a consummate storyteller, goes into detail mm-hmm. as to what you were talking about there, how he constantly tried to turn the redirect the light elsewhere is how you put it um, to, to other people, which surprised me because – you know, that, that just shows how humble he really was in this process. Even though he was an imperfect person, he really tried not to shine the light on himself. But I'm not sure that, I mean, certainly it was, it was an act of humility for him to do that. Uh, right. But Wilson had an ego and he knew he had an ego. I right. mean, he was very aware of that. He was self-aware of that. I mean, there was a time early on where he decided that the, that the name of this new movement should be the BW movement. You know, yes. I mean, this, yeah. this is not a thought that occurs to a, a deeply humble man. St. Francis wouldn't have a thought like that, you know. But, yeah. but yeah. Bill Wilson was very, very aware of his ego problems, and he, he really worked really, really hard to do whatever he could to temper that and, 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 
and to you know the problem was Wilson found Alcoholics Anonymous and then and then people start getting sober and you know Bill Wilson walks into a room walks into a, a conference walks into a meeting and it's like this is the guy who saved my life I mean does this guy walk on water you bet he does I, he saved my life I'd be dead if it wasn't for this guy so Wilson had this adulation just pouring at him all the time all the time and that increased throughout the 40s and into the 50s but so he was he was always yeah trying to take the spotlight off himself but also you know I is storytelling. You know, AA is a storytelling organization. That's what that's what people do in AA is tell their stories, and we tell story. They tell stories to each other. Um, but Wilson did a lot of cleaning up of his stories. Uh, one of the things I I say early in the book as an example of that is, you know, in in the first chapter of, of the book Alcoholics Anonymous today is Bill's story, and it's, it's his account of his own drinking and 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 getting sober, and um, the first the very first step in him getting sober is that he gets a phone call, he answers the phone, and his friend Ebby's on the other line. They've been drinkers together in the past. And Ebby wants to come over, and Bill invites him over, and they sit at the kitchen table. Bill's drinking. He's a little little, little bombed and offers Ebby a drink, and Ebby says, no, no, thank you. I'm not drinking anymore. And Bill's incredulous and says, how's that possible? And Ebby says, I, well, I got religion, Bill. And he talks to Bill a little bit, and then, it, and then he leaves. And it's one of the, it's the seminal moment for Bill Wilson's own sobriety, eventual sobriety, and, and for the foundation of AA. Now, Ebby Thatcher told that story. Uh, there's recordings of him telling that story in the early 50s. And one of those recordings, Bill Wilson was actually there. And Ebby tells a completely different story. Ebby says, I, Ebby says, I called up uh, and I got Lois on the phone. And I told her a little bit about what's going on, and she said, why don't you come over for dinner? It's probably good for Billy or something like that. Stuff. So they set a date a few days in advance, and he comes over and Gets there, there's nobody there. He finally gets let into the house, uh, and they have dinner downstairs. Abby, Bill, Lois, oh, and the woman from the, the the top floor of the brownstone they're living in. They've rented out the top floor to some woman. She comes down and she has dinner with them. Uh, and after dinner, they all go to the second floor parlor, according to Abby, and they sit around. And finally, Lois says, "So, Abby, why don't you tell us what's going on with you?" And Abby starts talking about the fact that he had met these Oxford group people in Vermont, and blah, they got him sober, and now he wasn't drinking, and he was hoping he could bring that message to Bill. Blah. Bill walks him to the to the subway late at night and puts his arm around him and says, "Abby, I don't know what you got, pal, but I could really use some of that stuff." Now, there's. There's very little correspondence between those two versions of that particular evening in Brooklyn in, in, uh, in November of 1935, or 1934. But, but, you know, Abby says, but he tells the story, one time he told the story, he said, listen, I know that's not the story you've read in the book, but you got to remember, one of us was drunk that night and one of us was sober. And I was a sober guy. And then he says, the other thing is, you got, you got to realize that, that, that the point is the same. And that's exactly what Wilson does with his story, is he gets rid of all the messy details, he gets rid of the inconvenient facts, and, and he boils the story down to one of the basic truths that AA uh, believes in and propagates, and that is that uh, the, the message of recovery can best be delivered when one alcoholic delivers it to another alcoholic. Mm -hmm. So Bill's story is about one alcoholic coming over to his house and delivering the message of recovery to him one-on-one -on -one and leaving. And that's why Bill told that story the way he told that story. If he left in all those messy details, the message might have been missed completely, and likely would have been missed completely by people hearing it. So, so Bill just, Bill just, he just, he just morphed the story into a parable. Uh, hey, William, how about the time when Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob met how have you found that to be a fairly close story or how any differences there? Yeah. Yeah. I, that's a, that is a close story, but again, it's out. I really, really confined my research to these almost just 18 months. I mean, I spilled over okay. another areas. This 18 months from you know, October, 1937, when they said, Hey, we should write a book. And then 18 months later, April, they published the book. But the gotcha. story about Dr. Bob is, yeah, I think that's, I think that's, pretty credible but you know there's all kinds of little bits and pieces i i was i got emails uh, yesterday from a guy who wrote a book uh, called uh, mr wilson and bill w i think it was called it was a good book good a really really nice book anyhow we were going back and forth and 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 he was talking about 
Bill Wilson pacing the floor in the Mayflower Hotel story. Now, I didn't really get into that, but he talked about the fact that, that he went to the Mayflower Hotel and the bar was like six or seven steps up to the left. You know, it wasn't just at the end of the corridor. And Bill Wilson, in one of the stories that he told about that pacing the Mayflower Hotel, actually admitted that he went into the bar and, and ordered a ginger ale feeling he would be completely safe. And no sooner had the ginger ale hit the bar than he realized he was not completely safe and he left the bar. So again, those are messy details that get left out of Bill's story. Bill just, you know, it's easier if he's pacing between the phone, the, the phone booth and, and, and the open door to the bar, you know, and uh, and you don't want to say you went in. So, so he changed the story. I'm good with that. I'm totally good with that. Sure. Sure. Um, Jim Burrell, you had, you, talked about buying his copy of the the big book um maybe i heard somewhere is he credited with the phrase god of our understanding or did in any of your research did you come across where that originated in the book yeah that's such a good question thank you uh jimmy always claimed that he was responsible for for getting that into the book and again I, I can give well, I can certainly give Burwell credit for that, but it's it, it's not like he invented it and went down and, and whispered in Bill's ear or, or beat him over the head with it and made him put it in the book. Um, when Wilson wrote his own story for the first time, uh, Bill's story, which would have been in late May of 1938, uh, actually he wrote three versions. He did a little little tiny version that didn't didn't go anyplace, and he quit. And then he wrote a long version. At that point, Bill was shooting for 5,000 words. He wanted each chapter to be 5,000 words. He was shooting for 5,000 words. The first version he wrote of his story was 12,500 words. Clearly missed the mark, and he hadn't gotten out of town's hospital yet. So, And then he went back and he wrote basically the version that, that is more or less what we see in the book today. In both that long version and the, and the first version of what we see in the book today, the phrase... Uh, that you you know God as you understand him is in both of those versions. So the version Bill claims that that it was something uh, that was said to him early on, and uh, and and so it's 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 it, it, it's right there. And you know, um, as Bill Wilson's writing this, Jim Burwell's out drinking again. He, he got sober in January. He started drinking in June. Right? D um, doesn't he accredit but, Abby for? I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, I was just. So then we get to when they're really fighting about about the 12 steps, which Bill Wilson didn't write until December of 1938. Then the, the fight's really happening between Bill Wilson, Hank Parkhurst, and Fitz Mayo, who was the guy arguing for a strongly religious book. And they're arguing over in, in, the, in the Newark office, Hank, Hank Parkhurst's Newark office. Um, and Burwell claimed that he was in on that argument, and, and Bill and Lois later, um, Bill and Helen, um, right, right. Ruth Hawk, the secretary, so, uh, they exchanged letters later, and uh, and uh, Bill said, "I don't remember Jim ever." And Jim says he was here. I don't remember. And, well, and, and the secretary says, "No, I don't. I don't remember him being here either." But what he was doing at the time was, Burwell was living with with Hank Parkhurst, and I think he was cranking Hank Parkhurst up to go in and beat Bill over the head that he had to put that in the twelve steps. Mm -hmm. Bill Wilson was very very clear in later comments. That, that he absolutely did not want to make that change, and they really twisted his arm hard. And finally, after much argument, he did, in fact, agree to put it into the steps. And he said, and then he admits that those people were right. He called it the, a, a ten strike. He consistently, you know, a bowling term, a ten strike. Um, he, he said, you know, without, without that phrase in the book, AA would have been much, much, much less successful. William, at what the are... time, he was... Oh, go ahead, go ahead, man. Sorry. Go ahead. No, I'm always done. Go ahead. I, what, what are, what are, is, or is there, or off the top of your head, some, some that sticks out to you? Um, is there a couple of things that are, would be considered common knowledge that actually aren't accurate? Are there, are there a couple of things that stand out to you um, that a lot of people think are, are real or truth that, that actually just aren't? Yeah, there's a bunch of those things. I mean, let's, if, if, you, if you look at look at my book, the first chapter is called "Challenging the Creation Myths," and there's 30 chapters after that, and somewhere in there, some sort of creation myth gets gets knocked down one way or the other. I mean, um, you know, it's a it's a common creation myth that uh, 
100 men wrote the book. Mm. You well, know? Bill Wilson wrote the book. Hank Parker actually wrote the chapter to employers, but the rest of the book, Bill Wilson wrote the book. Not to say he didn't have any input, but Bill Wilson wrote that book. It wasn't, it wasn't the project of 100 men. Yeah. Um, that's one thing. Another thing is there's all these uh, stories about, uh, about you know, the, the belief is that it was, because it was 100 men, that Akron was, was included. The people in Akron and Cleveland, the Ohio members, uh, made uh, significant contributions to the front half of the book. Absolutely untrue. Absolutely. Bill Wilson's sending the chapters out there, and, and Bob's giving them nothing. And there's letters in the archive. And there's, there's two letters from November of 1938 where, Bob, where Bill says to Bob, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really glad you like the chapters, but can, can you give me some? I'm, I'm looking for some criticism. I'm looking for some critique. I'm looking for some feedback here. Can you please give me some of that? He wasn't getting any of that. That's, that's, that's a myth. No doubt about it. Um, you know, there's um, Bill Wilson always talked about the fact that the six that the twelve steps came from the six steps. <clears throat> that I that was the the chapter on the writing of the twelve steps, chapter twenty three in my book, was the hardest thing I had to write. It took me at least six months to to make my way through that. You know, there's a famous story about Bill Wilson says, you know. Oh, I, I knew I had to write this thing, and I had this imaginary ulcer that I always got in these bad times. I went upstairs and laid down on the bed, yellow pad, pencil, finally thought about the six steps, broke them down, ended up putting numbers on them. There was 12 of them, went downstairs, and, you know, they complained that I had moved God up. I mean, that's Bill Wilson's story. I thought, when I started writing that chapter, I was like, I was buying into all that stuff. And I, mm. I thought I was just going to, you know, kind of retell that story. But as I looked at it, it just didn't make sense on this level, that level, and the other level. And it took me the longest time to, to figure out what was going on there. The first time Bill Wilson ever told the story about the six steps, that supposedly was the source for the 12 steps, was 1950, 11 years after the book was published. And it was just confusing me. I couldn't figure it out. So I thought, okay, there's got to be evidence here someplace. We have all these, we have a lot of primary documents. There's 20, I think there's 26 stories in the back of the first edition, first printing. You would think if there was a six-step program that those guys that got sober before the book was published, those guys who wrote their stories, would be talking about the six steps. They might not be calling them the six steps, but they'd at least be mentioning them. You can feel free to go back and read those 26 stories. There are no six steps. There's nothing even close to, like, mm. vaguely resembling the six steps in those stories. Nada. Absolutely not. Hank Parkhurst wrote a whole bunch of stuff about his own recovery. Fitz Mayo wrote a bunch about his own recovery. Uh, Frank Amos goes out to uh, one of the Rockefeller guys, goes out to Ohio in uh, February of 1938, comes back, has a report on what they're doing in Ohio. No six steps in that re I mean, Bill Wilson made it up. And there's reasons for that, and it's complicated. The whole thing is, the reason it took me six months to write the chapter, it's a complicated story. I, I would be loath to try and, uh, uh, try and encapsulate it in, 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 a, in a three minutes sentence here, you know? I think you've got you to gotta get the book and read the book if you want to know how that works, how I think it works. Hey, William, i got a question for you with that. that. How influential was the Oxford groups in the writing of the book? Or were they influential the at group, all? Well, the Oxford group, by the time we get to writing the book, the Oxford group uh, is, 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 they're not, they're, they're not, the, the New York group left the Oxford group. They broke with the Oxford group completely in April or May of 1937. The book didn't start getting written until 38. So the, the New York people, they're, they're out of the Oxford group. Doesn't mean they haven't been influenced, but they have been. They've been deeply influenced by it, but they have left the Oxford group. In Akron, Dr. Bob didn't, and, and, and the, the people in Akron and Cleveland did not leave the Oxford group until December of 1939, uh, nine months after the book was even published. They were still deeply involved with the Oxford group. But again, the Akron people didn't have a big influence on what got written in the front of the book. Um, Meditation, for instance, quiet, what, what, what the Oxford group people call quiet time was a, a profoundly important part of how people were staying sober in those days, most especially in Ohio. That's one of the things that Frank, Frank Amos, in this report that he wrote in February of 38, mentions very prominently. They say, you know, if you're not doing quiet time, you're not going to stay sober. I mean, he literally says something to that effect. 
on his seven points of things that they're doing to stay sober. And but but when Wilson starts writing about about uh, meditation when he's dealing with the eleventh step in in uh, chapter uh, six, uh, he doesn't mention doesn't use the phrase quite. He he writes in a way that that doesn't make it sound like they're doing Oxford Group stuff because the Oxford Group was a controversial organization at the time and a lot of people were not happy with it. I mean, some people liked it, but some people weren't happy with it at all. So he, he didn't want to put any kind of buzzwords in there that would signal that uh, that it was Oxford Group stuff they were talking about. So that particular chapter, that piece of that chapter on meditation uh, kind of dances around quiet time. And I know that the people in Ohio were furious that they ended up with 12 steps rather than four absolutes. Uh, they couldn't believe the four absolutes weren't mentioned anywhere in the book. Were the four absolutes influential in early AA and, and in people getting sore? Absolutely. Did it make it into the book? No, Wilson. Wilson dropped that like a hot potato. He was not about to go there. What, what about the term sponsor, William? Where did that come from? Why, why isn't it in, in the big book? Um, any thoughts on that, or did you find any any information about, out about that? No, there's nothing there because it wasn't it wasn't a common term at the time. It's, it, 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 the term appears nowhere in, in the documentation. As I said, I do I covered every piece of paper I could find in, in uh, several archives for 1937, 1938, and the first six months of 39. So you know the fact that it's not there it just just wasn't part of the part of the lingo of the common currency about how they talked about stuff. They talked the, the, the word that's used in the big book is prospect. Mm. Tell your prospect this. Approach your prospect this way. Prospect, prospect. Um, the story I've heard, I have no idea whether this is true. I haven't done research in this area. But the story I've heard was that in Cleveland, where Clarence was, Clarence Snyder was the big guy up in Cleveland. Uh, he got sober in January of 38. But up in Cleveland, they would they would take people to the hospital, take drugs to the hospital to get them sobered up. And it was uh, supposedly a story of hurt. I have no idea how accurate this is. The story of hurt is it was $5 a day to be in, in, the, in the detox unit and had mm. to stay for three or four days. And if the guy didn't have the, the $5, the hospital didn't want to take him. So the guy who brought him would sponsor him and agree to pay the $5 a day if he didn't have the money. Huh. Now, is that a true story? I don't know if that's a true story. It's a good story. You know, it the is. problem is that there's all these wonderful stories that are they're really fabulous stories, but they just don't, uh, you know, they're like urban legends or something. And that, that may be one of those. Can I tell you my favorite urban legend? Please. I, uh, I started to write the chapter working with others, right? Mm. <clears throat> so I, I thought, now, where can I better start than this story that I've heard over and over again from AA people? And this is the story. Bill Wilson sober five months. He's packing to go to Akron for this for this this fight he's going to have for the for the you know the the, the proxy fight he's going to have out in Akron. And uh, and he's just depressed. He's uh, he's been trying hard since he got sober. He's been sober for five months. He's been trying to get people sober. Trying to get people sober. Trying, didn't have a job, so he had a lot of time to get people sober. Now all of a sudden he's got a job. He's going to Akron. He's all depressed, and he's just just bitching and moaning to to. Uh, to Lois as he's packing, and, and Lois says, "Up, oh, Bill, that's not." He said, "I haven't gotten anybody sober." And Lois says, "Bill, that's not true. You stayed sober." I thought, now that's the mm -hmm. perfect story to launch a chapter about working with others. Perfect story. So I started looking for that story, and I couldn't. I mean, the, in the records, I couldn't find that story anywhere. I checked with, I checked with every AA historian I knew and every archive I knew and people who are just kind of really familiar with, with, with AA history, nobody could tell me where that story came from. And I, I finally had to conclude it's just, it's just it's, it, it's a story that somehow got made up after the fact. Bill Wilson and Lois never wrote that story or spoke that story. Uh, they never mentioned it in any way whatsoever. On the other hand, in the early days when Wilson was still involved with the Oxford Group in New York City, um, there's a there's a story. Lois was I don't know taking too long to put her makeup on or something, and Bill was complaining that they had to get out the door. And she she grabbed a shoe and threw it at Bill and said, "Damn your old meetings!" <laughs> now both of them both of them told that story because that's a cool story. It's a really yeah. cool story. But but the story of Bill packing and Lois saying, "But that's not true, Bill. You stayed sober," is a way better story. 
than the shoe story. <laughs> and they never told it. They told the shoe story. They didn't tell this other story. And you know what? It, it's just one of those, again, it's one of those mythological stories that conveys a truth about Alcoholics Anonymous. Bang, right, right in the middle of your eye. Bang, you just get shot with a story like that. Now, who, I don't know. You know, maybe in 1950, some guy was talking to his sponsor, and his sponsor said, you know, I bet when Bill was going, he was bitching that he didn't get anybody sober. And, you know, <laughs> Lois might have said to him, and boom, next thing you know, the story takes up. And now the story gets told and repeated, and it's such a good story that it gets, gets viral legs, what we would call what goes viral uh, today. And uh, it's a great story. I don't I, I think it's I think it's an anecdote. I think it's a made up story. I think it's an urban legend. Well, that's a good one, William. Um, Emmett Fox, did he is there any evidence that he influenced Bill in any way in his writing of the book? Because Emmett Fox's writings are so referred to a lot as, you know, things in early sobriety to read. Sure. Sure. And it was it was certainly one of the texts that they were reading. But, you know, th that whole of uh, the whole thing. There's there's a cottage industry among uh, a amateur AA historians about about you know did this end up in the book and did the Emanuel movement affect it and did how much were the, how much did Bill steal he did in fact steal a bunch of lines out of the Common Sense of Drinking by Richard Peabody and you know how much came out of I I just really really avoided that backstory stuff because it's got it's, you got I, you. I, I okay. was I was already in my own my own black hole you know that's a that's another <laughs> sure. much larger black hole if you ask me so. Um, Wilson was interested in what worked. Bill Wilson was the ultimate, ultimate and extreme American pragmatist. He just, if it worked, it was true. That was his deal. And they were always, I don't think Bill was, 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 was ever stuck on any kind of dogma. He just, he just, if, if, he, if he got something from Emmett Fox and it was working and it kept somebody sober, then he'd repeat it to somebody else. And if it didn't keep somebody sober, then it'd fall by the wayside. He was, he was a, he was a pragmatist. The whole program is so, so decidedly American. I mean, yeah. uh, what was, what, what was one of the most shocking things that you found out that you just had, you know, that really kind of blew you back? Well, I think it was, some of these things didn't just happen bang like that. You know, there yeah. were, there were, there were, there were lots of things that, that uh, little things that just knocked me out. You know, there's whenever you look into all, any of the literature, they talk about the book being edited by a professional. The book was given to a man named Tom Usel. Okay. Tom Usel did, did the editing on the book. I get into the document. Tom Usel did that. There's, there, there's, I, I, we don't want to waste time on what I thought he did, but, but there was a woman named Janet Blair, who really did most of the editing on the book. I've never mm. even heard of her before. I was like shocked. Oh, how could this woman have gotten dropped out of the story completely? Yeah. Um, but, but I think, I think probably the biggest thing was this, uh, realization of, of how, how, how angry people in Ohio were and how opposed to the Bigfoot project they actually were. I, I, that just, an, that just doesn't fit with anything I've ever been told about what goes on in Alcoholics Anonymous. And again, the whole co-founder thing, um, Mel Barger, who was a, a great, great AA historian, uh, I heard a recording that he did. He came into uh, AA in uh, Indiana in the early 50s, and he said when, we, when he came into AA, they called Bill Wilson the founder and Dr. Bob the co-founder. I thought that was really, really interesting. Mm -hmm. It's very clear to me that Bill Wilson is the founder of Alcoholics Anonymous, and this co-founder thing was something that he did to, to spread the responsibility and, and, uh, and the spotlight. But, you know, I, I looked hard for this. So when the earliest reference I can find to Bob Smith being called a co-founder was 1947. That's the first instance I can find in writing when they were talking about the, the 12th. Uh, they had a big party. I think it was in Cleveland for the 12th anniversary of AA, 1947. And they mentioned that uh, Bob is a co-founder. When they had a big party... Uh, on, on, on the 10th anniversary in 1945, uh, there's no mention of that. And so, and you know, even in the book, the first edition, first printing of the book, uh, it's uh, Bob's story is called The Doctor's Story, A Doctor's Story. Uh, when, when the second edition comes out in 1955, there's a little blurb on top explaining who
who Dr. Bob was and how he was a co-founder of AA, and they've changed the title of the story to Dr. Bob's Nightmare. Um, so, I mean, the whole idea that uh, that 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 AA was was almost solely uh, Bill Wilson is almost solely responsible for for what's in that book and for the success of AA was kind of shocking to me. I was I was going home with a, an AA friend one night, and he said to me. He said, besides Bill and Bob, who would be on AA Mount Rushmore? <laughs> and I said, uh, Robbie, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that Bob would make it. I, I, <laughs> and he almost drove off the road. He couldn't believe I had said that <laughs> because I knew I was doing all this research, you know. Yeah. And I said, well, Robbie, you know, there's Bill Wilson. I think Eddie Thatcher would have to be up there, even though he drank again for West Virginia. They wouldn't have an AA. And I think Hank Barker absolutely has to be up there, even though he drank again. I said, so Bob might be the fourth guy, but Frank Amos was also really, really important to the production of the book. And I personally believe that Bill Wilson was correct. The, the time before the publication of the book was the flying blind, pe- blind period. It's not that people weren't staying sober. It's not that people weren't doing good spiritual work to stay sober. Of course they were doing that. That's, of course, what was going on. But there was no, you know, today, if you say, what, who's AA, what's AA, how does AA work, people will just hand you the big book. Yeah. That's the deal. That's Alcoholics Anonymous. If you want to know what AA is, that's what it is. If you want to know how to get sober, this is how these people say you should get, this is it right here. There's Alcoholics Anonymous, which, in my opinion, created on April 10th, 1939, when that book was published. And and uh, so when I look for number four and I say maybe Frank Amos, Frank Amos is really, really important in, 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 in moving that project forward and getting it out the door. So uh, how, I, probably put, I probably put Dr. Bob as number four. Okay. How how much? Uh, that's good. That's good. <laughs> how much of uh, the the book? Uh, I know I've I've heard this term many times that the big book was written and based on the Bible. How how accurate is that statement? Um, you know, what what are your thoughts on that? You know, I've never heard that statement, uh, and uh, and I would I would I would I would completely disagree with that. I mean, I see no evidence of that whatsoever. You know, one of the, one of the problems, in my opinion, with the book, and now we're getting into personal opinion, this isn't research stuff, this is my personal opinion, is that, you know, a lot of people say the book was divinely inspired, and uh, okay, I, I, don't, I don't really want to get into that particular argument, uh, but, uh, but there are other people who go from the book is being divinely inspired to being the book being uh, the word of God, and now you know it's like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We can't change a word of it, and I, I really think Alcoholics Anonymous is doing themselves a grave disservice by saying you can't change even a comma in the first 164 pages of that book. Hmm. I mean, there are so many outdated things in that book. One of the things I try to do is give a context for the chapters in the book. Chapters like Two Wives, which 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 young women. Coming in Alcoholics Anonymous today, reading that book, uh, uh, some of them go screaming out the room. They can't believe how sexist that is. Um, and, you know, Hank Parker's chapter on two employers uh, is talking about a business climate that hasn't existed since the 1960s. Mm. And so in, in many ways, the, the text of the book is, is, is completely outdated and completely useless to people who knew people coming in 80 years after this book was originally written, uh, they're, 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 they're presented with this 1938 social, cultural, religious picture that they're expected to wrap their head around. And it's just... I, Do you think you know, there's going to be an overhaul for it coming up anytime? I mean, what are the chances of that? Is it being uh, something that's looked you know, at? Run, a is run by the General Service Conference, which meets in New York City every year. And, and, and they have decided that not a single word can be changed in that book. Now, personally, I think, I think, I think the book needs to, you know, to wives should be to spouses. Mm. Uh, and, and, and the family afterwards, those two chapters should be written by somebody in Al-Anon today. I, I mean, I think there needs to be a complete rewrite. And, mm. and I think we need to do the same thing with working with others because it's different. The climate's different. Same thing with two employers and a vision for you has a history of AA, and it talks about the success in Akron, which is a wonderful thing. 
But think of this. I mean, if you were, if you were writing a vision for you today and trying to, trying to wrap around a little bit of history about AAs and its success, it would be a big, much bigger story than just Akron, Ohio. Yeah. Um, so I, I really think that personally, this is my personal opinion, if Alcoholics Anonymous doesn't find a way to completely revamp, repackage, update what's in that book, and get it out by the 100th anniversary of this book, by by 2039. If there's not a new version, an alternate version, I'm not saying get rid of the old one. People are always going to want, going to revere the old one and and refer to it and go back to it. But for newcomers walking in the door, I really think they need a revised, significantly revised text. And if they don't have a significantly revised text when this thing's 100 years old in 2039, then I think shame on Alcoholics Anonymous mm. because they're just shooting themselves in the foot. So I, I think that I, one, one more point to kind of piggyback on that too. We see things, we're kind of on the topic, I feel like, of, 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 uh, of change, right? Things, and, and we can even mention technology here, the ability uh, to have podcasts like this, the ability to have digital content, digital meetings, um, all these types of different things. And with, with the younger generation coming up, things are definitely changing, not just from the big book, but on an outside larger perspective, just in the recovery movement in general. Um, I guess this maybe would be more of a, per, a personal question and then and we can see if there's anything we missed here and then we'll, we'll, we'll get to wrapping this thing up today. And I appreciate your time again, William. It's, it's been awesome and I've learned a lot today. Um, what, what is your thoughts on the anonymity uh, piece of this in people? And I'm not s- so much saying about uh, the program itself. I respect those traditions. I respect um, the program itself and, and, and uh, the foundation of it. There's so many there's so many young people and so many people in general coming out in this new movement that are very open about their recovery. Um, Do you think that that is, is there a conflict of interest there? What are your thoughts on that? Do you think it's a good thing? I mean, um, you know, I don't know. The whole anonymity thing was, you know, my understanding of it was driven by, uh, it was, it was an ego thing. In other words, they were worried that if people started, you know, really using their own identities, Mm. putting themselves out there, uh, and uh, and saying you know I'm 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 this famous person or I'm this great person and I got sober uh, through Alcoholics Anonymous and they drank again that would be problematic I mean I think that was the original motivator for anonymity there was also a great deal of shame around being an alcoholic uh, it wasn't the kind of thing you would you would casually admit in 1939 yeah. that and, and, and I think and I I, 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 I think, think that's a little bit of relook yeah. Oh, I think I'm sorry to interrupt you. I think that's a little bit of the point, though, too. And and that when you just say that is that there, it's trying to get rid of that shame, trying to trying to uh, get rid of that stigma behind it because it's so relevant in society. Every I mean, everybody I talk to has somebody, a, a niece, a, a uncle, a friend, yeah. somebody. Yeah. And so I, I feel like the more people are actually opening up about it, um, it's it's uh, it's becoming more. Uh, of something that's that's talked about in in uh, in order to break some of that stigma, break some of that shame. So I guess that's 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 yeah. more to the point. I bring it up, I guess, versus trying to challenge the anonymity thing. That's really not um, wasn't my intent. But I guess I guess I kind of uh, I kind of see it as a good thing almost. People opening up these conversations and being very open and not necessarily, um, hey, I'm 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 proud to be an alcoholic or I'm proud to have a addiction problem. But at the same time, I am proud of it because um, you know I've been able to change my life and and change my family dynamic and all that all that kind of stuff too. So I guess that's where I was going with yeah. it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think everything needs to be relooked at. You know, Bill Wilson talked about the text being frozen. He complained about it in the early 50s in a letter to a guy. He actually called the text of the big book frozen, and he complained bitterly about it. And he said, I'm writing some new stuff. Now, the new stuff that he was writing you know, to hopefully get around the frozenness of the text, and that was the 12 and 12. And then about three years after the 12 and 12 comes out, both of these things are in the book. But about 12 years after the, uh, three years after the 12 and 12 comes out, he, he writes, another guy writes to him, and he writes the guy back, and he says, it's fro- even the 12 and 12 is frozen now. I can't. He said, if I were to try and change one word in the 12 steps, I would be excommunicated from Alcoholics Anonymous. And I think it's really, um, it's a, I think it's a problem for institutions, you know, that they get so locked uh, in 
in, in, in the original whatever it was, you know, that it doesn't modify and morph as, as our cultures develop and uh, as society develops. Um, yeah, you know, good. there's this great quote from uh, Wilson did an interview with Dorothy Schneider, Clarence Schneider's wife, in 54. I love this quote. She says, the people talk as though there were 100 men, that they all went saintly and were taken straight up to heaven. And God just guided Bill's hand, and Bill just sat there and let the words come through. Actually, she says, it wasn't anything like that at all. And no, it wasn't anything like that at all. This is a very, very human story about how this book got put together, how these people came together, how these early guys stayed sober and, and actually got it done. It's a human story. I think the, hopefully the humanness of all these characters jumps off the pages of my book. Mm. And I know that is in contrast to the, to the divinely inspired stories that get tired, told all the time. Those stories tell a story of Al- Alcoholics Anonymous creation, formation, and success that's a miraculous story. And I like that story, but I got to tell you, I believe that the story that's told in my book, the human story that's told in my book, is far more miraculous than the traditional, you know, just just hallowed stories that have been told about AA's origin. I think it's far yeah. more miraculous. Um, well, it's, it's, it's just amazing. It's been great to have you on today, and yes. uh, I just appreciate you sending some books out to us. And for those out there listening, uh, I'd highly encourage you to check it out. Um, there's a ton of great content in it. Where can folks find the book, William? Uh, I've got a, a website. It's easy enough to remember, hopefully. It's www.writingthebigbook.com, um, just as the beginning of the title of the book is, writingthebigbook.com. And if you go there, there's a little got a little three minute video of me talking about the book and there's a sample chapter the one on uh, when bill wilson wrote there is a solution there's a table of contents there's a bunch of reviews by people who read the book before publication and uh and there's a link you can just click on amazon or barnes and noble or even the publisher central recovery press and order the book mm. got it buddy anything you want to add before we uh take off today william appreciate your time sir thank you thank you it's been that's been it's some been, good information. An honor Appreciate and the conversation. Thank you. Good stuff. Thanks again, William. Uh, so I'll put that writingthebigbook.com one more time, www.writingthebigbook.com. That'll be in the show notes if anyone wants to uh, go in there and check that out. Uh, be sure to check us out at thatsoberguy.com. You can connect with us on Instagram, at Real That Sober Guy, on Twitter, at Shane Raymer. Uh, Once again, big thanks to both William and Buddy. I appreciate you guys. It was a great conversation today. Uh, Share the podcast with a friend. And uh, also check out SoberPodcast.com if you're looking for a great network of sober podcasts. Um, Peace, love, and respect. Love you guys. Thanks again for tuning in today. Stay sober out there. Keep up the great work. Good stuff.